The world today continues to be one great mission field, even in countries that have a long history of Christian traditions. The late Holy Father, Pope John Paul II, once said, it is not enough for us to discover Christ, we must also bring him to others. Hello, my name is Father Jude Eli, and I represent Western Dominican Preaching Ministry, and I would like to welcome you to our presentation question concerning tribute to Caesar. I think in order to understand excerpts of the teaching of Jesus as found within the New Testament, you have to keep in mind that it was a very common reality when the New Testament scriptures were in fact written by the various authors during the apostolic period, that it was a common reality where you would have this or that person being remembered orally by his or her disciples. And so what we have here, when we look at the New Testament, always keep in mind that you're having one event talked about in many different ways. So, for example, when you have the question, shall we offer tribute or, or a tax to Caesar, you can have one event, but with multiple oral traditions coming or stemming from that event. When you have that, that is called a parallel narrative. One event talked about in many different ways. So when you start to read the biblical understanding or the biblical articulation of what Jesus did and what he said, understand that in the Hebrew mind, in the Semitic mind, you can have a divergence, you can have a variation, you can have a multiplicity of how one event can in fact be expressed orally and then later on in the course of time that tradition or tradition, because you might have variation within one event, you can have multiple attestations of the same event written down in documentary form. This is what we have when we have the New Testament scriptures. In this particular situation, you have Jesus in a confrontational mode with the elders of Israel and also representatives from Herod. You must understand that Israel was under Roman occupation. The Roman Imperium um, had its strength and its power manifested throughout the known world. So even in Palestine, even in Aretz Israel, the land of Israel, whether it be the Judea kingdom in the south or the Galilean kingdom in the north, the influence, the power of Rome was felt by the Jewish people. Jewish people did not like Roman interference in their life. Don't forget, due to the laws of kosher, you, things that you can taste, touch, and handle, and things that you could not taste and touch and handle. Again, the kosher rules, Leviticus 17, there were certain things in and of themselves, if touched, received, consumed, whatever, could, rail, could, could, could render you ritualistically defiled. That was in reference to foods, animals, as well as places, things, and people. So what we have here is this Gentile influence in the land of promise, in the land of Israel. Israel is occupied. You pay tribute to Caesar. Caesar was not only a royal monarch, but in the eyes of the Israelite, Caesar was a detestable pagan person. He represented gods that did not exist, or under certain circumstances, certain political uh, uh, emperors or uh, Caesar granted themselves divinity. This was horrific. This was something detestable for the Jew. And to have this pagan influence in the land of Israel for many especially what we call the third party or the third philosophy, namely the zealots of Israel, uh, any type of Gentile influence in the land of Israel was simply not acceptable. In this particular narrative found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, what do we have? We have people from Herod, namely King Herod. We have people representing Caesar uh, as seen through the line of Herod, Herod and his family were raised in Rome. Some of them were not well respected because of their collaboration with this Gentile uh, pagan force in the country 
and the nation of Israel. Be that what it may, Israel was a vassal. That means they owed tribute, they owed taxation to a Gentile system that the Jews believed was arch-defiling because of kosher law. We now have a situation where Jesus is preaching against various forms of extortion, economic realities, social realities, and in this particular situation, we have Jesus being asked questions from the eldership of Israel. So, for example, in Mark chapter 12, verses 13 to 17, verse 13, and they sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians, people from the court of Herod, to entrap him in his talk. Now, this is a very important line here. Who are these people? The Pharisees. Who were the Pharisees? They were the exponents of the oral and written Torah. They were the elders and the teachers of Israel. They had a right to sit on the seat of Moses' ex-cathedra and to interpret readily with authority the mind and disposition of Moses and the Torah, namely the Torah, the first five books of the Hebrew Scriptures that God revealed to the children of Israel through Moses on Sinai, and they sat on the seat of Moses, ex-cathedra, and they had the legitimacy to interpret how you make applicable God's Word, Torah, to everyday human life. The Pharisees believed that God is one, and he has revealed himself to Israel through the Torah, and through the later development of what the Torah meant, what we call oral Torah. And the oral Torah was a system of later interpretations making the written Torah livable and therefore applicable. The Mishnah, the Halagah, and the Haggadah are aspects of the oral Torah. The oral Torah breathed life into the written book. The Pharisees were the teachers of both Torah, both the written Torah and the oral Torah. Jesus never denied their legitimacy to sit on the seat or throne of Moses and to extrapolate, to make sense, to interpret Torah. He never questioned that authority. He might have questioned them personally, what they said about this or that, pericope or passage found in the Torah, but he never disagreed that they had a legitimate right to speak in the name of Moses, as well as the Sanhedrin or the High Jewish Council. He never questioned that right. Second, Pharisees believed that the Torah and the both written and oral were, in fact, the Word of God. Second, if you lived a life by Torah, justice and mercy, that you inculcate, you incarnate in your life God's Word as articulated by Moses, by the Spirit, and through the Sanhedrin that had been uh, established as early as the Sinaitic event or the event of Sinai as, as we read in Exodus. Yeah. He never questioned that. When you had a life worthy of Torah, in justice and mercy, you are a true Israelite. And you were a Jew, not so much what you believe, but how you acted, how you were Torah observant. Pharisees also believed that when you died, you did not stop living. They believed in the immortality of the soul, and they also believed in bodily resurrection. They also believed in God's providential care. God's guidance throughout the entire created universe. They also believed in angels and demons and spirits. Notice, basic pharisaical teaching, Jesus never disagreed with. He held that the Torah was, in fact, the Word of God, and that God's providence is, in fact, real. It's not a matter of fate or happen chance, no. There was providence. God is the ultimate guide. And yes, the human person survives death and lives forever. And there will be a time, in fact, there will be a bodily resurrection. He also believed in angels and demons. 
So in a real sense, at least theologically, there was no contradiction between the teachings of Jesus and the elders of Israel. Jesus' confrontation with the elders of Israel deals with them personally. Their inability to articulate or to interpret well God's word for God's people. So in this particular juncture, this is a period, this is a time of confrontation. And like I say, it's a parallel narrative. It's found in Matthew 22, Mark 12, and Luke 20. So the fact that, that they sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the people from Herod, it's no longer a matter of theology because Israel is in fact a theocracy. The social, political, economic rulers are also religious ones. It is a religious state. It's not a secular state. Therefore, the people of Herod are also involved. The teachings of Jesus hasn't just been some sort of a theological, religious debate about matters of the Torah. Now, the people of Herod have been introduced to the issue, introduced to the confrontational mode between the elders of Israel and Jesus. And, and as a result, they are going to test Jesus. And they came to him and said to him, Teacher, this is Mark chapter 12, verse 14. And they came to him and said, Teacher, notice teacher, rabbi. Now, it's, it is a common trait in the um, synoptic tradition. Synoptic tradition is the gospel tradition of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Because when you put them together, there's similarities, okay? Whenever that particular tradition uses the term teacher, they don't mean it with a, with a genuine understanding. They are mocking him. Teacher, we know that you are true and care for no man, for you do not regard the position of men, but truly teach the way of God. So they're trying to worm in to the good intentions of Jesus. That's Mark. However, when you read Matthew's account of the situation, they say, teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully, for you care for no man, for you do not regard the position of men. And then in Matthew 22, verse 17, tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? In verse 18, but Jesus, aware of their malice. But in Mark 12, they ask him the following. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? And there, Mark has two questions, not just one. There is the general question, is it lawful simply in and of itself to pay taxes to Caesar? And then the next question, should we pay taxes to Caesar? Luke has, Luke 20, verse 22 says, is it lawful to, to, to give tribute to, to, uh, to Caesar or not? In Mark, the citation reads in 15b, but knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, in Luke 22, he perceived in their craftiness and said to them. And in Matthew, he was aware of their malice. Three interesting responses to the question from the heart of Jesus. So right then and there, you, you, you have a real human attempt to capture the mind, the pathos, the understanding, the disposition of Jesus. And whether he had malice, or whether he perceived they had malice, or whether they, were, they were, were in fact hypocritical, or they were simply crafty, one thing is very clear. The next sentences are in fact confrontational. So you have a clear understanding that things are not well here. And so, in Mark chapter 12, Verse 15, why do you put me to the test? It's right up front. Why do you put me to the test? Bring me the coin and, and let me look at it. And they brought one and he said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. Jesus said to him, 
Well, render to Caesars the things that are Caesars, and to God the things that are God. And they were amazed at him. That's Mark, and Mark is the earliest gospel, written about 70 A.D., and so the articulation of the response of Jesus is rather terse and to the point. Matthew, who's writing to a Hebrew audience, says the following. And Jesus said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, render therefore to Caesar's the things that are, that are Caesar's and the things that are God. And when they heard of this, this is Matthew, they marveled and they left him and went away. In Luke, there is a different translation. He says the exact same thing, render to Caesar's what, what belonged to Caesar. And they were not able to press him or to catch him by what they said, but marveling at his answer, they were silent. What's happening here? What's happening here is the fact that Jesus basically doesn't answer the question. He doesn't answer the question. He goes, because in Mark, he is saying, they ask him, generally speaking, is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor? But now, the, the next question, should we pay that tribute? See, that's absent in Matthew and in Luke. So there's a different um, honing of the question. But in Mark, which is the earliest gospel, one thing is abundantly clear. Jesus, we want to ask you a basic question. And of course, Jesus, from Mark and Matthew's understanding is that they are testing him. Is he going to speak against what we understand, the land of Israel? Or will he speak against Caesar? We want to know. Again, if you say yes to the question, is it lawful to pay taxes or tribute to Caesar? Now that is one simple question. Well, is it lawful, generically speaking, to pay tax to legitimate authority? That's one question. But now, since we're under Roman occupation and we hate the Romans, Jesus, we want to be even more specific. Should we, you and I, pay the tax to these pagan, defiling influence in our own land? That's the real issue. Now, if you say yes, ah, then you are collaborating with the Roman Imperium. What type of rabbi are you? And if he says no, oh, are you inciting insurrection by not paying the tax? Should we revolt against Caesar? Don't forget now, in the Markan synoptic tradition is both the Pharisees as well as the people from Herod. So you have representatives of temple and state, temple and monarchy, Jewish monarchy. So it's a no-win situation. They are trying to trip him up. That's why in Matthew, he knows their malice. In, in Mark, he knows their hypocrisy. And in Luke, he knows how crafty, like a snake, like a serpent, you really are. So what does he do? He doesn't answer the question. He, he does not say, pay the tax, or, or don't pay the tax. What does he say? Well, there are things that belong to Caesar. Well, if there are things that genuinely, authoritatively belong to Caesar, then, then give Caesar his due. Notice there's no taxation. There's no taxation. And then give to God what belongs to God. He simply nullifies the question. However, what's exciting is that he says, do you have a coin? Yes, we do. And they pull out the coin. You see, in the temple area, in order to offer sacrifice, you had to take Gentile money and exchange it with the money changers to get liturgical or Jewish money that was non-defiled. Gentile money, by its very nature, is arch-defiling. 
Why? That's why in the text, in all three texts, he says, give me a coin. Whose image is it? Well, it's Caesar's. And who is Caesar? One who pretends to have divine authority. One who takes the place of God. And then he says, what is the inscription on the text or on the coin? And of course, it would have read, Tiberius Caesar, son of divine Augustus, great high priest. It's an attestation of divinity. So you have to ask the question, why, are, why do you, a Pharisee or someone from Herod, have a coin in your pocket that represents something utterly different from what we believe? How did you get that coin? Where did you get that coin? Oh, so are you going to pay the tax? So it's thrust back. That's why you have to look at the tax very, very carefully. You, have to, you really have to look at the text very, very carefully. That means what Jesus says, well, huh, let's see the coin that you are going to pay, tribute to Caesar. So you, so you do have Gentile coinage, don't you? Well, why do you, have, why do you have Gentile coinage? Oh, so you are saying that there's certain things that the secular society or the state has a right over you. So you are using things of Caesar, are you not? Are you not using this coinage? Oh, you are using this coinage. Oh, I see. Notice he didn't have a coin. Notice Jesus did not produce the coin. He asked you, do you have a coin? Ah, what image? Ah, this is the image of a person who believes that he is deified. He's high priest's son of God, Tiberius. My, my. That's his image, and look at what's around the coin. What are the letters? What are the words? Ah, I see. Well, obviously, uh, you're using coinage uh, of the state, and you're asking me whether or not we should pay taxes, generally speaking or specifically. And he says, I'm not answering, but I will tell you this. What belongs to the state is of the state, and what belongs to God is, in fact, of God's. He doesn't fall for the trap. So what does this mean to us? There are certain things that are germane to, to, to the state, to human culture, and there are certain things by their very nature that are germane and proper to God. They are not in contradiction. They are not in contradiction. What is true within the human community, if, the, if legitimate authority fosters distributive justice, justice for the common good, for the common welfare, seeks protection of human rights for all people, then that is a legitimizing authority. Then there's God's authority, which is over all. God's authority over all. And everything pertains to God. So when Jesus says, basically for all practical purposes, what belongs to Caesar, render, give to him. What, what, and what belongs to God, belongs to God. Well, what belongs to God? Everything belongs to God. It's under his jurisdiction, his ultimate jurisdiction. So it is with us. In our own faith walk, in our own faith journey, we, we try to make sense of how as Catholic Christians are we good citizens and, how, and as Catholic Christians are we faithful to what we know to be true. For us Roman Catholics, there is no contradiction. Just as long as the legitimizing authority of the state does not interfere with the absolute authority of God. It's God who we worship, not the state. It's God who we put our faith in, not the state. And yet ultimately, the state is under God's divine providence 
as we all are. Where do we have our allegiance? It's with God. May we keep that at the center of our hearts as we believe that as a Catholic Christian, we render to God what is God's, we render to the state what is the state's, but all belongs to God. May the, may the word of God, rich as it is, dwell within our hearts this day. I've always heard people talking about Jesus being alive, but I never really experienced the risen Jesus until I invited him into my heart and into my life. Only then did I experience Jesus alive. If you have that same experience, you haven't experienced the risen Jesus and Jesus truly being alive in your heart and in your life, now is a great opportunity for you to, to amend that. Why don't you pray with me? Short little prayer and invite Jesus into your heart and into your life and ask the Lord to reveal himself to you in a real way so that you too will have no doubt that Christ is alive and well and living in here. Okay? Let's invite him. Dear Lord Jesus, I open up my heart and my life to you. I invite you, Lord, to come into my heart and into my life and to dwell in my heart forever. Lord, I ask you to fill me with your grace and with your Holy Spirit. Help me, Lord Jesus, to amend my life. Help me, Lord, by your grace to follow you. Help me, Lord, to love you. And help me, Lord, day by day to get to, get to know you in a real and personal way. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for for dying on the cross and for paying the price for my redemption. I thank you, Lord, for that act of love that you did for me. Lord, from this moment on, you are my Lord and Savior. I acknowledge you as my Lord and Savior. And I thank you, Lord, for every blessing, for every grace. Amen.